Hey, how's it going? Today we're going to talk about Oppenheimer and his history. There's a lot of in-depth information about him, and he's done quite a bit for the society, especially the nuclear warhead, but let's move forward. With the movie coming out, a major question was there an actual real-life atomic bomb made? No, Christopher Nolan does love to use practical effects such as the Dark Knight explosion scene, which he actually exploded a building in that film, which they were gonna demolish that building anyway, so he was lucky on that matter. And also dropping an airplane from The Dark Knight Rises from an airplane, and then also the spinning room in Inception. The fact is, Christopher Nolan actually did do explosion, but it wasn't the size of an atomic bomb. Per se. Collaborator Scott Fisher stated, One factor, for example, was the use of camera trickery in the form of a bigature explosion shots, different from a miniature set. It was more of a big set. Fisher explained, in other words, the team created massive explosions, but the proximity of the camera made them seem even larger on screen. I apologize, I am reading from a script because my memory is terrible. Thank you for understanding. He also said, It is like an old school technique. Fisher explained, We don't call them miniatures, we call them bigatures. We do them as big as possible can, but we can reduce the scale so it's manageable. It's getting it closer to the camera and doing as big as you can in the environment. It's mostly gasoline, propane, any of that kind of stuff, because you get so much bang for your buck. But then we also bring in stuff like aluminum powder and magnesium to really enhance the brightness of the explosion and give it a certain look as well. The movie stars Cecilian Murphy, Emily Blunt as Oppenheimer's wife, and fellow scientist Kitty, Matt Damon as Leslie Groves, the military leader in the project, the Manhattan, and Florence Paul, Josh Harnett, and Robert Downey Jr., among other celebrities, A-listers. Julius Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York City on April 22, 1904. His parents, Julius S. Oppenheimer, a wealthy German textile merchant, and Elia Friedman, an artist, were of Jewish descent but did not observe the religious traditions. Their art collection included works by Pablo Picasso, Edmund Vuillard, and at least three original paintings by Vincent van Gogh. Robert had a younger brother, Frank, who also became a physicist, who later became the founder of the Exploratorium Science Museum in San Francisco. He studied at the Ethical Cultural Society School, whose physics laboratory has since been named for him, and entered Harvard in 1922. Intending to become a chemist but soon switched to physics, he graduated summa cum laude, latte, sounds like a Starbucks drink, that would be quite tasty, and went to England to conduct research at Cambridge University in their laboratory, working under J.J. Thompson, which I believe he also won an award for many physics teachings as well. In 1926, Oppenheimer went to the University of Gotten to study under Max Born, obtaining his PhD at the age of 22, which Max Born was also very high regard in physics as well, or scientific studies. Also, he was attracted to the experimental physics by a course Theodynamics taught by Percy Bridgman, which attracted him to physics that dealt with heat and radiation. We see a pattern coming of atomic bomb, and Percy also, I believe, won a lot of awards as well. So there's a lot of people Oppenheimer got tutored by that led him into the right direction of the atomic bomb, which supposedly he did not like. There he published many important contributions to the then newly developed quantum theory, most notably a famous paper on the so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which separates nuclear motion from electronic motion in the mathematical treatment of molecules. That is a mouthful. In 1927, he returned to Harvard to study mathematical physics and as a National Research Council Fellow, and in early 1928, he studied at the California Institute of Technology. He accepted an assistant professorship in physics at the University of California, Berkeley, and maintained a joint appointment with California Institute of Technology. In the ensuing 13 years, he commuted between the two universities and many of his associates students commuted with him. Oppenheimer became credited with being a founding father of the American School of Theoretical Physics. Interesting matter. He did important research in astrophysics, nuclear physics, spectroscopy, and quantum field theory, which I did not know. He made important contributions to the theory of cosmic ray showers and did work with eventually led towards the description of quantum tunneling. In the 1930s, he was the first to write papers suggesting the existence of what we call today black holes. 
Not sure if he understood if it was the dirty word or if it was space. It was a joke that I just said. Oppenheimer went to Cambridge in the hope of landing another offer. He was ultimately accepted by J.J. Thompson on condition that he could complete a basic laboratory course. Oppenheimer was very unhappy at Cambridge and wrote to a friend, I am having a pretty bad time. The lab work is terribly bore, and I am so bad at this, it is impossible to feel that I am learning anything. He developed an antagonist relationship with his tutor, Patrick Blackhead. While on the vacation, as recalled by his friend Francis Ferguson, Oppenheimer once confessed that he had left an apple dosed with chemicals on his desk. While Ferguson accounts is the only detailed version of this event, Oppenheimer's parents were alerted by the university authorities who considered placing him on probation. His parents successfully lobbied the authorities not to do so. Money works well in the universities. Oppenheimer was a tall, thin, chain smoker man who often neglected to eat, while during the periods of intensive thought and concentration. Many of his friends said he had self-destructive tendencies, probably smoking, or his nerves were all around so he had to smoke. A disturbing event occurred when he took a vacation from his studies in Cambridge to meet up with Ferguson in Paris. Ferguson noticed that Oppenheimer was not well. To help distract him from his depression, Ferguson told Oppenheimer that he, Ferguson, was to marry his girlfriend, Frances Keeley. Oppenheimer did not take the news well. He jumped on Ferguson and tried to strangle him. Although Ferguson easily fended off the attack, the episode convinced him of Oppenheimer's deep psychological troubles. Throughout his life, Oppenheimer was plagued by periods of depression, and he once told his brother, I need physics more than friends. Physics is an exciting friendship. Oppenheimer did important research in theoretical astronomy, especially as related in general relativity and nuclear theory, such as when he's seen by Einstein in famous photographs. Nuclear physics also in spectroscopy and quantum field theory, including the extent into the quantum electrodynamics. I can explain this in another video. <laughs> The formal mathematics of relative quantum mechanics also attracted his attention throughout. He doubted his ideas. His work predicted many later findings, such as the neutron mesen and neutron star. Oppenheimer papers were considered difficult to understand even by the standards by the abstract topics he was expert in. He was fond of using elegant but extremely complex principles. Though he was sometimes criticized for making mathematical mistakes, presumably out of haste. His physics was good, said his student Snyder, but his math was awful. He studied under several Nobel Prize winners, such as Albert Einstein. The rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany stirred his first interest in politics. In 1936, he sided with the Republic during the Civil War in Spain, where he became acquainted with communist students. Although his father's death in 1937 left Oppenheimer with a fortune that allowed him to subside anti-fascist organizations, the tragic suffering inflicted by Joseph Stalin on Russian scientists led him to withdraw his association with the Communist Party. In fact, he never joined the party, and at the same time reinforced him as a liberal democratic philosophy. In fact, the FBI opened a file on Oppenheimer in March of 1941. It recorded that he attended a meeting in December 1940 at Chevalier's home that was also attended by the Communist Party's California State Secretary, William Schneiderman, and its treasurer, Isaac Falkoff. Sounds like an interesting last name, Falkoff. The FBI noted that Oppenheimer was on the executive committee of the Liberties Union, which is considered a communist front organization. Shortly thereafter, the FBI added Oppenheimer on its index for arrest in case of national emergency, which is interesting the fact that they wanted him to build a bomb as well. Debates over Oppenheimer's party membership or lack thereof have turned on very fine points. Almost all historians agree he had a strong left-wing views during this time and interacted with party members. Though there is considerable dispute over whether he was officially a member of the party. At his 1954 security clearance hearings, he denied being a member of the Communist Party, but identified himself as a fellow traveler, which he defined as someone who agrees with many of the goals of communism, but is not willing to blindly follow orders from any Communist Party of people. On October 9th of 1941, two months before the United States entered World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt approved a crash course program to develop an atomic bomb. Oppenheimer and Groves decided for security, they needed a centralized location, secret research laboratory in a remote location. Scouting for a site in late 1942, 
Oppenheimer was drawn to New Mexico, not far from his ranch. On November of 16th of 1942, Oppenheimer and Groves and other people toured the site. Oppenheimer feared that the high cliffs surrounding the site would make his people feel claustrophobic, while the engineers were also concerned of the possibility of flooding. He then suggested an area that he knew well. The area was flat, and it was called Santa Fe, New Mexico, which was also the site of a private boys' school, the Los Alamos Ranch School. The engineers were concerned about the poor access road and the water supply but otherwise felt that it was ideal. The Los Alamos laboratory was built on the site of the school, taking over some of its buildings. While many new buildings were erected in a great haste, the laboratory Oppenheimer assembled a group of the top physicists of the time, which he called the Lumineers. Los Alamos was initially supposed to be a military laboratory, and Oppenheimer and other researchers were to be commissioned into the army. He went so far as to order himself as a Lieutenant Colonel's uniform and take the army physical test which he failed. Army doctors considered him underweight at 128 pounds. I am surprised he weighed that much. Diagnosed with chronic cough as tuberculosis and were concerned about his chronic joint pain. The plan to commission scientists fell through with Rabbi and Robert Balcher balked at the idea. Groves and Opperhorn devised a compromise where the laboratory was operated by the University of California under the contract of the War Department. It soon turned out that Oppenheimer hugely underestimated the magnitude of the project. Los Alamos grew from a few hundred people in 1943 to over 6,000 in 1945. At this point in the war, there was considerable anxiety among the scientists that the Germans might be making a faster progress on an atomic bomb. In a letter of May 25th, 1943, Oppenheimer responded to a proposal by Fermi to use radioactive material to poison German food supplies. Oppenheimer asked Fermi whether he could produce enough stromium without letting too many in on the secret. Oppenheimer continued, I think we should not attempt a plan unless we can poison food sufficient to kill a half a million men. Which is interesting that he doesn't like the atomic bomb, but he wanted to kill the German people. In 1943, development efforts were distracted to a plutonium gum-type fission weapon called the Thin Man. Initially, research on the properties of plutonium was done using cyclotron-generated plutonium-239 which was extremely pure but could be created in tiny amounts. When Los Alamos received the first sample of plutonium from the X-10 graphite reactor in April 1944, a problem was discovered. Reactor bred plutonium had a higher concentration of plutonium-240, making it unstable for use in gun-type weapon. In July 1944, Oppenheimer abandoned the gun design in favor of an implosion-type weapon. The joint work of scientists at Los Alamos resulted in the world's first nuclear explosion in July 16, 1945. Oppenheimer had given the site the codename Trinity in mid-1944 and said later that it was from the one of John Donald's Holly sonnets. According to the historian Greg Herkin, this naming could have been an allusion to John Talloch, who had committed suicide a few months before and had, in the 1930s, introduce Oppenheimer to Donnie's work. For his service as director of Los Alamos, Oppenheimer was awarded the Medal for Merit by President Truman in 1946. I believe Truman also said that Oppenheimer was a whiny person after the atomic bomb because he regretted it so much. The Manhattan Project was top secret and did not become public knowledge until after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Oppenheimer became a national spokesman for science who was a new type of technological power. He became a household name and became a portrait appeared on the covers of Life and Time magazines. Nuclear physics became a powerful force on all governments of the world began to realize the strategic and political power that came into nuclear weapons. Like many scientists of his generations, he felt that security from the atomic bombs would come only from a national organizations. 
such as the newly formed United Nations during that time frame, which could institute a program to stiffen the nuclear armed race. Starting in 1954, Oppenheimer lived on the island of St. John in the U.S. of Virgin Islands. In 1957, he purchased a two-acre tract of land on Gibney Beach, where he built a Spartan home on the beach. He spent a considerable amount of time sailing with his daughter Tony and his wife Kitty. Oppenheimer was a chain smoker who was diagnosed with throat cancer in late 1965. After his surgery, he underwent unsuccessful radiation treatment and chemotherapy in late 1966. He fell into a coma in February 15th of 1967 and died at the home in Princeton in New Jersey on February 18th at the age of 62. Memorial service was held a week later at the Alexander Hell on the campus of Princeton University. The service was attended by 600 of his scientific and political and military associates. Oppenheimer's body was cremated and placed into the ocean. His wife took the ashes to the St. John and dropped the urn into the sea within the site of his beach house in the Virgin Islands. In October of 1972, Kitty died of age 62 of intestinal disease. Oppenheimer Ranch in New Mexico was then inherited by his son Peter, and the beach property was inherited by their daughter, Catherine. Oppenheimer. Tony was refused security clearance for her chosen vacation as a United Nations translator at the FBI brought up the old charges against her father, which is quite odd since it was against her father and not herself. In January 1977, she committed suicide at the age of 32, three months after her second marriage, which ended at that time frame. Her ex-husband found her hanging in their family beach house unfortunately. She left the property to the people of St. John for the public park and recreational area. The original house was built to close to the coast and succumb to a hurricane. So that is the history of Oppenheimer, grandfather of the atomic bomb. What do you think of the atomic bomb? Do you think it was a good thing? Do you think it was a bad thing? I find it quite scary that they built the atomic bomb, but I also find it good that they did because it slowed down World War III. We'll see what happens in World War III. Hopefully it doesn't occur, but it showed the power to stop World War II, which is quite interesting. Oppenheimer supposedly did not like that he built this powerful bomb once it was detonated, but let me know down in the comments below what you think of the new movie. What do you think of Christopher Nolan directing it? I'm quite infatuated with his work by chance, but do you think there's another director that should have made it? Maybe Michael Bay put some Transformers in there or something? Thank you for the history of Oppenheimer. What are your thoughts on Oppenheimer's past and do you think atomic bomb is good for history itself thank you and have a great day bye